this lecture, we're going to discuss matching forage supply with animal demand. So the big picture that I want you to grasp is that animals can be used as a biological tool to manage rangelands. And ultimately, uh, the main objective is to maintain healthy rangelands and healthy animals. So ultimately, the livestock producer can generate income. The next thing is that forage production is driven by temperature, soil characteristics, and plant residue. And as all of you know, this changes from year to year. Furthermore, you need to know that the know what the landscape can healthily support to minimize degradation and maximize plant and animal production. So going into this lecture, you need to remember that plants, the younger they are, the higher they are in protein, energy, vitamins, minerals, and even water, and they're very low in structural um, either carbohydrates such as cellulose and um, other structural components such as lignin. However, as these plants mature, the nutrients, the protein, energy, vitamins, and minerals decreases as the plant matures, whereas fiber and lignin increases. So ultimately, the more mature plants get, the, um, the lower the quality of that plant is going to be. This slide highlights the demand cycle for a western cow-calf operation. On the x-axis we have the season and on the y-axis um, is the amount of energy and nutrients that are required by the animal. So during um, winter and early spring the cow is going to have fairly low nutrient requirements. However, once she approaches her third trimester of gestation, that calf inside her is going to begin to, to increase. It's going to begin to um, you know, double, triple in size, and that requires energy. So the cow's demand goes up late spring, and it continues until that calf is born. Once the calf is born, the cow begins to lactate, and that is the point at which the cow needs the most nutrients in her entire life. So after that peak in late spring, early summer, her nutrient requirements are going to go down and down little by little. And that's because the calf, as the calf gets older, is beginning to consume plant material and is becoming less reliable on the cow. And ultimately, in early fall, the, the calf is weaned, and the energy requirements of the cow drops precipitously and pretty darn fast because she's not lactating anymore, and she, is, she can conserve that energy that she once used for lactation. Now I'm going to highlight the plant supply cycle for a western cow-calf operation on the y-axis is the amount of energy and nutrients available in the forage supply and on the x-axis is the season. And rapid spring growth begins with the onset of warm spring temperatures, longer days, and higher light intensities. And peak forage production occurs at the end of the rapid spring growth. Now the forage supply is going to decrease as temperatures get hotter um, during the summertime and it's going to continue into the fall and winter. Sometimes um, during the winter time there is also a, a winter growth period that begins after fall growth slows due to um, cooling temperatures, shorter days, and lower light level. Uh, excuse me, lower light. Now I superimposed animal demand over forage supply and I want to highlight that um, in winter or even in early spring, animal demand for um, a cow-calf operation for the cows can be higher than that of what forage supply offers. So during the winter time, um, we can see in early spring that the cow's energy and protein needs aren't being met by the forage. And we're going to discuss 
management practices um, that we can implement in order to overcome that. But when forage supply is greater during late spring, early summer, it typically provides enough nutrients for um, the cow and her calf, um, even when the cow is lactating. This particular figure um, estimates seasonal crude protein concentration of sagebrush bunchgrass range associated requirements of lactating and non-lactating cows. On the y-axis is the amount of crude protein in the grass and on the x-axis we have um, months everywhere from May all the way to October. Now the bars indicate um, the the crude protein in the grass. So in May, it's about 19%, but that tailors off. Um, in June, it's about 14%, and in July, it goes down to about 6%. Now, the horizontal lines you see for the cow-calf pair, that's the protein requirement of the cow-calf pair. So typically, that requirement is at about 10%, and we can see that in late June, early July, that the grasses or the, the sagebrush bunch grass um, range isn't going to meet that, um, that nutrient requirement. Now, if you look in July, the cow alone, the, the nutrient requirement for the cow is less than that of the cow and calf, right? Because now we have just one. Um, was it a 1,000 to 1,400-pound uh, cow? She's going to need by herself only about 7% crude protein in her diet. And the grasses, anywhere between July and October, fall below what she needs. So ultimately, um, once again, there's going to be management implications on supplementing in the future. And knowing what you have out on the range what are the plants that are out there and how can you manage and um, meet these animals' protein, protein and nutrient? One of the important concepts to understand now is dry matter intake. Dry matter intake is the plant material that the animal consumes that is void of water. So it's whatever the animal consumes minus water. And this is important to know because different species um, consume different amounts of plant biomass. And this has implications for fire management, rangeland management, and even livestock production. So animals don't have dry matter intake requirements, but they consume approximately 1.5 to 4% of their body weight on a dry matter basis. And I'm gonna elaborate on this in the next slide. But the Spanish goat, the black buck antelope, and the calf, less than 100 pounds, is going to consume about 4% of their body weight on a dry matter basis. That's um, a 4% dry matter intake. Now, fallow deer, sheep, mule deer, white-tailed deer are going to consume about 3.5% um, of their body weight. They're going to have 3.5% DMI. Whereas beef cattle, anywhere between 1,000 to 1,500 pounds, are going to consume about 2% of their body weight. So in order to calculate dry matter intake, um, you need to determine how much the animal weighs. So if a 200-pound mule deer consumes 3.5% of their body weight on a dry matter basis, they're going to consume about 7 pounds of plant material. Um, on a dry matter basis. So that's seven pounds of plant material without water. Stocking conservatively is one way to help the animals meet their demand. Um, this sets demand well below the supply on the landscape. So if there's more forage for animals to choose from, they can, um, each of the animals can select the more nutritious foods in their diet and ultimately, um, this selectivity allows them to have a higher qual quality diet. And it also reduces the energy required to find an adequate diet. So the, 
the less the animal travels, right, the, the less energy they expend. If they have to walk up on the mountainside, they're gonna, um, they're gonna use a lot of energy. Where if you stock conservatively, where you give each animal enough land to select the most nutritious plants, then um, they're more likely to meet their demand based on what's available. So timing is another management strategy in order to help meet animals' demands. Um, it's important to get the timing right. So plan so time of the greatest animal need coincides with time of the greatest nutrient supply. So consider the type of forage. Um, it's important to have um, calves drop um, or to have calves born or lambs born when forage is, is abundant, when it's nice and green. It's also important for, for the cows that are lactating to have an abundance of forage also. Now, the second thing, it's necessary to consider the type of operation. Cow-calf operations are gonna have higher nutrient requirements um, because of gestation and lactation compared to stocking, stocking steers. So depending on the type of operation, um, it's important to time the demand that those animals have with the, the plant material out on the landscape. Next, timing is the basis for season suitability grazing. Um, sometimes season suitability grazing has to do with moving animals up in elevation um, as the season progresses. And this is really common with um, sheep. And also, it's important to birth in the spring when forage is of greatest quality. And native animals already do this. They, um, they adapt um, from an evolutionary standpoint. They are able to birth their, their young when the forage is green, lush, there's a lot of energy. Because if they, if they were able to um, give birth during winter when forage is, is scarce, they're not likely to live. Another management strategy to help meet animal demand is to manipulate vegetation to meet the animal needs. And one way is to introduce different plants into pastures. This can provide an abundant, high quality forage during a particular season. For example, um, a lot of people loathe crested wheatgrass because when it's mature, it's not very digestible. However, crested wheatgrass provides good spring and fall grazing because of its growth pattern. It's, it's very nutritional during that time. And um, there's always engineering and developing of new types of grasses. For example, new, new rye grasses are being developed um, and they're able to maintain energy and even protein values well into the winter. So really manipulating the vegetation to meet animal needs is also a way to help meet the animals. Now, one can manage for palatable shrubs in order to manipulate the vegetation to meet animal needs. Um, palatable shrubs can provide uh, protein and phosphorus during um, the winter time. So one way is to graze cattle in order to reduce grass biomass so that shrubs will grow. And shrubs are important for, for winter deer habitat. Next, um, another way to manipulate vegetation to meet animal needs is to manage for plant diversity. Um, use the forages that can be used throughout the season. Seasonal forages, forage supply is improved as plant diversity increases because plant mature, plants mature at different rates and have different levels of nutrients. So if you have a wide variety of plants throughout the year, that can help meet the animals. Now, how do grazing animals cope with period of low forage quality? Well, what they do is they build up fat when forage quality is high. Grazing animals with good fat reserves can survive anywhere between 30 and 60 days with little or no food consumption. Now, mule deer, um, mule deer does 
with high levels of fat reserves have survived for periods of complete starvation for up to 64 days. That's incredible. And what they do is um, they store those fat reserves and they use them for energy. And that fat supply can contain the fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, K, and E. And as I mentioned, was it two lectures ago, and um, in animal nutrition, animals will store up vitamin A in their fat for anywhere between um, 60 to 120 days. Now, they also, um, wildlife are able to lower their metabolic rate and consequent, consequently lower their energy requirements. And this helps them out um, from an evolutionary standpoint. It helps them to survive through the winter. So they can, um, they don't die whenever forage quality is gone and food is scarce. What they do is they can minimize their metabolic activity um, so that they don't require so much food. Now, they also have um, nitrogen recycling. Some of the nitri nitrogen that gets absorbed out of the room and is put into the saliva where it goes back into the, the digestive system for possible absorption instead of being lost in the urine. So that's one way that um, ruminants can help cope is to re recycle nitrogen. Now also they can ingest soil. Um, soil ingestion can play a critical role in permitting ruminants to meet um, mineral requirements. There's iron in the soil, there's um, phosphorus, and so sometimes you'll see animals, in particular ruminants, consuming the soil to um, meet their mineral needs. Now, supplementation is the major operations expense confronting the range livestock industry. Um, energy. It's rarely economical to supplement energy. And when, er when energy is supplemented, the use of range vegetation generally de decreases. So during the winter time, when um, the, the forage is dormant and um, there's not very many, there's not very much plant material out on the range, then energy is typically supplemented. High quality energy um, supplements include grains. This is pretty much impractical on rangelands except under drought or heavy snow. And this can be used effectively for, for young animals in a creep feeder. A creep feeder is, is um, uh, I guess, an apparatus or a, a type of feeder where, where the, the young can go through and access the, the feeder where the adults cannot. So the young have access to the feed where the adults do not. Now, low quality energy includes hay or straw, and this is necessary to supplement when animals cannot meet daily dry matter requirements on rangeland, typically during winter and drought. So remember, hay or straw is basically an energy source, and that energy source is derived from cellulose. The next type of supplementation is protein or nitrogen supplementation. And the use of range may actually increase with nitrogen supplementation. And there's two different types of um, Yes, protein supplementation. There's non-protein nitrogen, um, for example, urea and biuret. They have lower cost, lower costs than true protein. And um, what happens is once those non-protein nitrogen sources go into the rumen, the microorganisms are able to utilize the nitrogen and make microbial protein. And the microbial protein can be used to meet about a third of the total protein requirements of ruminants. Now the other type of protein are high protein feeds like alfalfa, cottonseed meal, soybean meal, but these are pretty expensive and they're typically supplemented in, in the south of the United States. Now protein supplementation is important when crude protein values of range fall below 6% because below 6% the, um, the environment inside the rumen becomes um, stunted. Uh, the rumen microbial growth is inhibited and structural carbohydrates cannot be adequately digested. So anytime um, the range um, forage has less than 6% crude protein, it's necessary 
to supplement protein with either non-protein nitrogen or a high protein. So in summary, plant quality as a nutritional source decreases as the plant matures. And animal nutritional demands changes throughout the year and depends on where the animal is in production. Is the animal growing, lactating, fattening? Um, is the female gestating? Um, also, you need to meet demand by timing nutrient supply with animal demand. It's important to know what you have out on the range and in those plants and what's the requirement? What does your animal require? Next, manage land to increase diverse vegetation to meet nutrient, uh, to meet animal needs. And this is important to have different plants scattered throughout the vegetation to help the animals meet their demand. Next, wildlife can lower their metabolic rate to limit energy expenditure when plant nutrients are scarce. And what I want to highlight here is that from an evolutionary perspective, um, these animals, they don't need as much energy during the wintertime because there's not as much forage available. And this helps them survive and this helps their species continue. Lastly, supplementation may help meet animal demand. Um, and it's important to know when to supplement and what to supplement. So are you supplement protein, energy, minerals, and vitamins um, throughout the year? When does the animal's demand exceed the supply of the forage?